The game-winning interception by Stanford's defense. We will look at what Lance Anderson, Stanford's defensive coordinator, did to force Justin Herbert to be late on the throw. And also the game-winning touchdown pass by K.J. Costello to Colby Parkinson. They ran that same play two times prior in the second half hitting a different progression each time. So we will look at that as well. But thanks for checking this out. This is my week four breakdown. We're going to keep the same format as last week, meaning we're going to look at just one game, two different scenarios, and both scenarios equally apply to each team. So hang around for the entire video. I appreciate you checking this out. Let's break down some ball. We're going to start with a Stanford passing game concept. This concept is run out of a three-by-one formation with the tight end flexed, meaning he's not attached to the offensive line and his route is a bender route it's not a straight ahead vertical seam route and it's not a 10 yard basic route where he's cutting at a sharp angle it's somewhere in between with his job to take the middle of the field the number two receiver the receiver in the slot runs a five yard under route and those two guys their job is to high low the mike linebacker that's who this play is attacking it's it's attacking the mike linebacker and putting a receiver in front of him and a receiver behind him and forcing him to make a decision Who's he going to cover? If he covers the tight end, we're throwing the slot receiver. If he covers the slot receiver, we're going to throw the tight end behind him. The third progression on this is the outside receiver also on a five-yard under route, five, five, six-yard under route. So it goes one to two to three. That's the progression for K.J. Costello. Let's see how he attacks this. The yards rushing on 15 carries. It's a first down throw. And they fire it short, Colby Parkinson. KJ Costello attacks us by hitting the number two receiver. And while I say receiver, in Stanford's case, it's technically a tight end with Colby Parkinson, but he's lined up in a receiver position. And like we explained before, they high load the mic. So the mic carried the number three receiver on his bender route, therefore vacating his zone. And Colby Parkinson, Stanford's tight end, lined up in a receiver position, just replaced him with his five yard under. KJ Costello hits him and they get a nice, nice gain. Stanford ran this concept the first time at about the 120 mark in the third quarter. They liked the result. Oh, I like that. Yeah, me too. And they came right back to it at about the 13 minute mark in the fourth quarter to pick up a big gain then. Watch how it plays out here. Costello from the pocket, delivers across the middle, and it's Smith making a catch, the big tight end. This time we see KJ Costello hit a different progression the bender down the middle of the field. Let's check out the back view to see how that happened. Right here, we can see what's called a middle field open structure by the defense in, in football terms. And what that means is that Oregon's gonna be in a two safety structure, leaving the middle of the field open and susceptible. That's different than the first time Oregon ran this in that they had one safety and the middle of the field was closed because their one safety was sitting smack dab in the middle. And in terms of K.J. Costello's mind, when he walks to the line of scrimmage, that's information that he knows pre-snap. Oh, I see what's going on in here. Okay, if the middle of the field's open, that's an ideal scenario for this tight end bender route because that's the exact area the tight end's um, attacking. Versus if the middle of the field's closed, I'm going to work my two under routes. Want the first one by the number two receiver. If that's taken away, I'm going to work outside by the number one receiver. And those are all tidbits that KJ Costello's processing pre-snap. On this play, he's thinking, okay, I got middle field open. I'm going to work the tight end bender to Caden Smith down to the under route by Colby Parkinson. Here, Troy Dye, Oregon's middle linebacker, a great player on Oregon's defense, is learning from the previous time. He said, last time I carried the tight end, Caden Smith, and Colby Parkinson came underneath. So this time, I'm going to pass off Caden Smith and try to jump Colby Parkinson. But as a result, KJ Costello and Stanford make him pay by hitting the bender route right behind Troy Dye, but in front of the secondary for a big gain for Stanford. So Max, if my middle linebacker Troy Dye is in trouble versus one high, and he's in trouble versus two high, and what can I do to help him out? Well, what you can do is start in a too high structure and to try to confuse KJ Costello, you can spin on the snap of the ball and go to a one high structure, forcing your backside safety to help out on Caden Smith going vertical to prevent getting beat by either the under route or the bender route. That's exactly what Oregon does, but watch where it leaves him susceptible now. 
Costello has time. Looks for the end zone. Jump ball. Deflected. Caught. Touchdown. That's the difference between a pre-snap read and a post-snap read. Pre-snap, KJ Costello seeing a too high safety structure. But when he goes to snap the ball, Oregon starts creeping to go to one high. And so KJ Costello is saying, all right, we've talked about all these three receivers on the bottom of the screen, but what about that receiver on the top of the screen, or on this, in this case, a tight end? When Oregon spins to go one high to take away the bender, they're now susceptible on the boundary side um, seam, seam area. And that's exactly what we see Stanford take advantage with with a nice little post route. It's a poor throw by K.J. Costello, a little behind him, but an incredible catch by Colby Parkinson, probably a little lucky. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? But it's hard to say this is lucky time and time again when Caden Smith and Colby Parkinson for Stanford keep making these plays. But that's a look inside K.J. Costello's mind as to how he's approaching this play. It's a great job by Stanford's offense as a whole. From K.J. Costello to the tight ends, Colby Parkinson and Caden Smith to the receivers. Be running. <laughs> making them pay. Not locking in on one receiver or one specific progression, but saying, all right, I'm going to take what the defense gives me. We always hear that, but what does that mean? This is a perfect example in that with each variation of coverage, with each variation of how defenders are passing off receivers, I'm going to change where I go with the ball. And may not have been the best throw by K.J. Costello, but he gave his guy a chance and put it in the general vicinity to, make it, to allow an athlete to make a play. Great job by Stanford's offense, and it was a touchdown that won him the game. But now it's Oregon's turn to respond in overtime. After a nice little completion to get the drive going, we're going to jump to the second down play. It's on the 10-yard line, and the ball's in Justin Herbert's hands. Second and goal, play clock at three. Herbert fires, end zone, incomplete. What I want you to notice is when we watch it again, Lance Anderson, Stanford's defensive coordinator, elects to bring both backers and a safety to allocate seven guys rushing the passer. Just so we can get a feel for how the game's progressing, let's go to the very next play. And this time I want, to watch, I want you to watch how Lance Anderson this time only elects to rush four guys. So as Justin Herbert goes and throws the ball, it's a different look. Last time he rushed seven, this time he rushed four. Stanford's defensive coordinator is doing a great job mixing things up. Now, let's watch the fourth down play. For all the marbles, let's see what Oregon does. Play to force double overtime. And now a timeout taken. Oregon will spend the timeout. Timeout Oregon. But what's interesting is if we go back and look at that play, Lance Anderson had both of his linebackers creeping up to rush the passer. Both those linebackers make six guys rushing the passer, and if the other linebacker comes, that's seven. So if you're Oregon and you're Marcus Arroyo or Mario Cristobal on their staff, you're saying you, you may have been wanting to call the timeout either way. That may have been your mindset the whole time is that we're going to line up, see what Stanford's defense is going to give us, and then we're going to call timeout and discuss the best play moving forward. Or the other scenario is you had a great play in mind expecting Stanford to drop seven into coverage or drop eight into coverage, and oh crap, they gave you a different look, so we got to call a timeout and get to a better play and discuss it on the sideline. But the point I want to drive home is that when we look at the second down, Lance Anderson decided to blitz and bring seven. Then on third down, he decided to drop and only bring the four down linemen. Then before Oregon calls a timeout, Stanford's given the, the same impression of I'm, we're going to blitz two or three guys to rush seven total. So now when I'm Oregon and I'm Justin Herbert going to the sideline, I get on the headset and talk to Marcus Arroyo. I have zero idea whether or not Stanford's going to bring the house or drop into coverage. This is noteworthy because as an offensive coordinator, your call against heavy blitz when, when a defense rushes seven guys is night and day different than when a defense drops seven guys into coverage. When a team drops seven into coverage, you need a pass play that takes some time to develop, allowing receivers to sit in tight windows. Versus if a, team, if a defense sends the house, brings the house with heavy blitz, you need a play call that ha has some quick hitters, quick fade balls, quick little rub routes. So the two play calls are totally different. So then when you don't know what a defensive coordinator is going to give you, you have to call a play that's the combination of the both and may not be your favorite play call to attack a specific scheme. 
And that's exactly what I think happened here when we watched this fourth down play. They rush four. Herbert, plenty of time, throws across the middle, bat it up, intercepted, and Stanford stages a stunning comeback. When we watch that play, we can see Justin Herbert's eyes start to his right, and then he works back to his left to find that dig route. But if we're being honest, Justin Herbert is late on this dig ball throw. You're late. For what? Fair enough. Would this have been a heck of a throw and great timing if he made it? 100%. But those are the things you would expect of a quarterback Justin, Justin Herbert's level. But on this one play, he is a beat late. And so it makes me think that Stanford's ability to mix up coverage and pressure in the few plays prior muddied up the picture for Justin Herbert on this last play, forcing his eyes to just be a tad bit late getting back to that dig throw. And it's not a knock on Justin Herbert. He played unreal this entire game. But it is shining the spotlight on Stanford's entire defensive unit and getting it done in crunch time, mixing up what you're doing and executing at a very high level. I started this video series by saying we're really going to dive deep into the game of football. Ooh, I'm about to dive in. That next level analysis. And I think today's episode really showed that. It showed how complex this game can get. A look inside the quarterback's mind, the offensive and defensive coordinator's mind. So today was fun. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you have not already, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel, share this video, comment, let me know what you think, and I will see you guys next week.